we were out in the <laughs> South Pacific in the Palu Island area near one big island, Pileliu. And the 5th Fleet and the 7th Fleet were coming together. It was a major invasion. And they said, get Richard off of that ship. There's hundreds of ships <laughs> all around us and trying to find one that's going back to the States. <clears throat> they said, pack your sea bag and be ready to go. Well, I had it. That's all I owned in this whole world was in that old sea bag, which, by the way, my daughter has. I found it the other day, stuck back in a place in the garage, and she said, I'll take that. <laughs> I carried it a many a mile. Well, I started calling on the radio, trying to find a ship. All that was there was all kinds of ships for the invasion. I'm not real good at remembering how long it took, but I think it was around four hours before they finally contacted somebody that told us the General S.D. Sturgis, an old transport, was loaded with the Marines headed back to the States. <clears throat> so they started looking for the General S.D. Sturgis. We got on a whale boat, two sailors, and me and my old sea bag. Where would you start looking for the General S.D. Sturgis with hundreds of ships all around you? Well, that took another three or four hours. It was almost late afternoon before they were able to find it. I got aboard, and the first thing that showed up was a Marine. Follow me. I don't know, they thought I was some kind of a spy or something. But he took me down and opened the door. He said, this is your room. I said, not gonna throw me in the brig? No, this is your room. It must have been an officer's room at one time because I had a bed in it and a head with a shower. <laughs> I was treated like an officer. But every time I left that room, there was that Marine behind me. Every time we went to chow, that's all. But something had happened. During making all those calls and telling them what they were trying to accomplish, <clears throat> Word got to the Stars and Stripes Army paper. And guess what? They printed a sheet of paper and it was scattered around and what the radio, they heard on the radio and between that paper, when I would go down to Chow with this Marine, they were pointing, that's the guy, he was on the, I thought, I thought, honest, I didn't do nothing wrong. But that's the way it was. And the Navy was so embarrassed, because this was Admiral Raymond Spruance's flagship, <coughs> the commander of the whole 5th Fleet. He wasn't on at the same time, though. They had a new captain. But they were headed back to San Diego to the 12th Naval District. And all I could think of was, what am I going to do when I get there? I didn't have a penny. I never had been paid. So, and all I owned was what was in that old sea bag. Well, the Navy had contacted the lieutenant commander of this old Sturgis and give him orders not to get me to the States because there was reporters at San Diego waiting for this ship so they could take my picture and interview me. And they said, they had had enough embarrassment just to put him off at Pearl Harbor. <laughs> well, that was going to make it a little harder for me to get home. <laughs> My destination when I left the South Pacific was 1317 College Avenue, Davenport, Iowa. There was a girl there that I hadn't seen for almost a year. And her last words I heard her say when I was with her, we were still 17 at the time, not quite 18. And she said, 
We're seeing too much of each other. We gotta quit seeing each other for a while. <laughs> well, that wasn't hard. I went out to California and boarded the Indianapolis and I was gone for a while. <laughs> when we got up close to Pearl, this commander, Lieutenant Commander, invited me into his room. Oh, he was so kind. Sailor, we think you should get off here at Pearl Harbor because we don't know what the Navy's going to do to you when you get there at the 12th Naval District. They're liable to put you in jail or make you pay for the time you was on the Indy. They made it sound like it was going to be pretty bad. It could be. They said, you haven't been paid any money. You haven't got any money. Why don't you get off here at Pearl Harbor and get a job and buy some clothes and when you get ready to go back to the States, just come down here and let us know. We'll get you back to the States. Liar, liar, I knew you were lying. <laughs> just wanted to get rid of Richard. Took my old sea bag, put me ashore at Pearl Harbor. The Indy had been there once before, and I had liberty in Honolulu, but they had buses to take us in, those who were on liberty. I didn't know how far it was to Honolulu <laughs> from Pearl Harbor, especially right where they left me off, as far as you can get. Started walking. No cars, no buses, and it was starting to get a little dark. I just kept walking. I thought, what am I gonna do? I can't lay out here by the road. Kept walking. Pretty soon it was dark, and I saw a light down the road. And I started for that light. I said, Surely there'll be somebody there to help me. Got down there, and it was a small little, little house, and it said American Legion. I thought, I'm going to get help here. I went inside and there was a young man behind a row of tables. And I said, I'm Richard Sprague and I need some help. I wanted to get to Honolulu. I don't know, I haven't got any money. And he looked kind of puzzled at me. I could tell he wasn't gonna help me. But a little heavy set short man come out of a door and he come over to where I was. And he was in navy khaki shorts, summer sh shirt. He said, what'd you say your name was? I said, Sprague, Richard L. Put his hand out. I'm Admiral Sprague. <laughs> I know who Admiral Sprague was. I got to tell you a little bit about him. He had a fleet of 10 cans, destroyers, about 10 or 11 destroyers. There were 10 cans as far as the Navy went. And they were in the backwaters on the west side of the Philippines. And we had just invaded at Leyte and two other places. And the Japanese fleet had been almost destroyed at Midway, but there was enough of it left that they divided it when we invaded the Philippines. They had a, the aircraft carriers that they had left up at the north end. And back in the backwaters on the west side of the Philippines was the other fleet with the battleships, the cr cruisers and uh, destroyers. And they had formed a pact that at a certain time they would the commander of our 7th fleet with his aircraft carriers was going to go up and wipe out the rest of the Japanese Navy. And that they were, with a given signal, they were going to come out and come up behind and scissor the 7th fleet in between them. It could have been pretty bad. But what do you think happened? 
Admiral Sprague was back there with these tin cans and picked them up on radar. All of those ships. Well, he said, boys, we can't do much. I don't think they had a gun bearer. That, uh, there wasn't a five inch gun in the whole mess. And they had torpedoes and uh, three inch. And they said, we're gonna hit them with everything we got. We may go down, boys, but we're gonna really hit them. The Japanese had no idea what was coming. They opened up with all of their power they had, night, boom, boom, boom. They had them on radar so they could hit them, but they couldn't do much damage with those small guns and they were firing torpedoes. Well, the commander of the Jap fleet thought it was our major fleet that had found them and they said, let's get out of here. Mm -hmm. And they sailed through the islands and waters and went up and got out way, all the way out up to the North Fleet where they all combined and went north. And Admiral Sprague got told that he had chased the Jap fleet out of the Philippine waters with 10 destroyers. And they wrote a book, The Last Hurrah for the Tin Cans. And it was all about his story and the destroyers chasing the Jap Navy out. And this was Admiral Sprague. I knew what he had done. What year is this, Richard? <clears throat> what year is this? That happened in the late September, 1st October, 44. But I was headed home. Yeah, I lost track of weeks and months out there, but I was headed home. It was <coughs> 45. May or June, I, I can't tell you for sure. <clears throat> well, the man talking to me about getting out, I had got out and there I walked down and was so tired and hungry. And when he said, I'm Admiral Sprague, and he knew my story, and I said, I know yours. And he said, let's talk. He said, uh, tell me, all I know is what happened after they found you on the Indian. What happened before? How did it all come about? <clears throat> well, I had to go back and tell him from September when I had enlisted, September 43, just five weeks after I was 17. And I told him how the, I had wobbled and passed, flunked the test that I was taking as an aviation radio man. And they sent me to Algiers and New Orleans, the hospitals, and they finally decided they were going to send me to Hot Springs, Arkansas for a year for <coughs> physiotherapy. I didn't even know what physiotherapy meant. And these two doctors looked at me and I said, I guess you're not supposed to talk to the naval officers this way. I said, I didn't join the Navy to lay around in a hospital for a year. So they sent me home. And the rest of the story you knew from my, when I told you. He was very interested in everything I was saying. And he said, what did you do before you went into the Navy? And I told him I was, uh, was an apprentice machinist at the Rock Island Arsenal for six months before I had to drive a truck and move my family down to, down to Texas. Well, he opened up his billfold and gave me $10. That was a very good start. And what this area was, was called the civilian housing area. All the people that worked on ships and the shipyards that worked for the government, the government supplied them these little cabins to live in. And there was four beds in each cabin and there was a kitchen there. He said, this kitchen is open 24 hours a day and you can get as much as you want to eat and go back as many times, it's 50 cents a meal. Man, I'd fallen into heaven. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, see that cabin over there? He pointed to one, yes. He said, there's an empty bed in there. There's only three people to sleep in that cabin. He said, you go over there, first get yourself a good meal, then go over there and lay down and get a good night's rest and I'll see you here in the morning at 10 o'clock. 
food never tasted so good. Mm. Of course, the chow on up Indianapolis wasn't bad, but it couldn't compare with this civilian cooking and anything you want. It, it, I can't describe it. It was so fabulous. And I went over, put that old sea bag down by my bed, and got in there, and I died. I didn't know anything until I woke up the next morning. And the people sleeping in the other three beds had come in and slept the night and left. And the place was empty but me. So I went over again and had breakfast. Went back and met the admiral at 10 o'clock, like he said. And he said, did you get a good night's sleep? I said, I died. I didn't know. Well, he said, I've got you a job. You said you were an apprentice machinist. I got you a job down at the Honolulu Iron Works as a machinist helper. <laughs> How can you beat this? I had $10 in my pocket. Almost I'd spent a dollar for meals. I had a place to sleep. And, and I had a job, something I, I, I like to do. And he said, um, Guy, you got a guy coming tomorrow to take you over and show you where that is, and then he's going to take you up to Captain uh, George. What did I say his last name was? I this was a oh George Plummer, Captain George Plummer. He was an ex merchant marine captain. He said he's got a place for you to stay. You can sleep at his place. Can you just see God unfolding this for me? Whoever could have imagined. I could have been walking down that old dirt road and a, a day later had a place to sleep, had a job, had money in my pocket. I couldn't believe everything that was happening. And he said, you uh, rest the rest of the day over there and he said, I'll see you here in the morning at 10 o'clock. Well, I went back and I couldn't stand that messy cabin. I took all the blankets and sheets off those other three beds and went outside, shook them out, made the beds like the Navy had taught us. Took everything off the floor, old shoes, clothes scattered around. I found a mop and a bucket in the back room. I swept it and mopped the floors. And it was getting late in the afternoon, still nobody had come in. I don't think those people, I don't know the hours they were working, but I never saw anybody. Well, I had supper and went to bed early. Just like the night before, I fell asleep and never woke up till morning. And when I did, there was another $10 laying on top of my nightstand. The guys liked me cleaning up their cabin and making their beds. Man, I had 20 bucks almost in my pocket. I was going to see Admiral Sprague. He said he had something else to tell me. 10 o'clock, I went over there. And there was a young man come up with a brand new car. He said, he's going to take you and show you where the Honolulu Iron Works is and how you get there. And he'll take you up and show you Captain George's uh, place. He, it's, it's up high on the mountain. I couldn't thank him enough. I said, the first paycheck I get, Admiral, you're getting this $10 back. Don't worry about it. Well, when the gentleman came with the car, he didn't say a word. He picked up my old sea bag, threw it in the trunk. He said, sit down right here. And we went on. If I would have tried to walk into Honolulu that night, I couldn't have made it. I realized how far it was. But he drove right down, showed me Honolulu Iron Works, and the trolley that takes me down there was a half a block away. He said, it'll bring you right here. And there was a little restaurant where I could buy my lunch. That old Okinawa Japanese machinist that was running this big lathe, it was, bed was 20 feet long, and it, he had a big sugar cane roller, about six feet in diameter, and he was facing off the ends of them. Overhead crane set it in place, and he takes his four jaw chuck and make, adjusts, gets it in there, and I know everything he's doing. He never said a word to me. I wasn't helping him. No way. He worked there 
several years without a helper and he wasn't going to have this Yankee helping him. <laughs> he drove up on the mountain part way. He stopped in front of a big building, new building. It looked like a government building of some kind. He said, you sit here. I'm going inside. I'll just be a few minutes. Don't get out of the car. I wasn't about to get out of the car. About 10 and 12 minutes later, he came back and put a piece of paper on my lap. I looked. I said, check for $20. He said, that's a unemployment for last week. I said, I wasn't here last week. He said, were you working? No. Then you get the $20. <laughs> I'm getting rich and I hadn't done anything. I got a job and a place to live. Who's responsible for this? Who's been with me all my life? Mm -hmm. To God be the glory. Amen. Always yeah. and forevermore. Well, I went in 1259 Pohukuana Street. I'll never forget that. George was a, a, a big man. And he was glad to see me. And he said, I don't have a bed for you tonight. You'll have to sleep on the couch in the living room. But he said, I'll have a place for you by tomorrow. I met a young man there, and he was in the Merchant Marines. His name was Monty, naturally. He's from Missoula, Montana. And we became good friends. The captain said to me, I am, have the news broadcast at 6 o'clock every night here at the radio station. He said, would you allow me to interview you on the radio I said, I, he said, I think the people here would like to hear your story. I said, if you've got anything you want me to say, I'll say it because I don't have a thing to hide. Now, this happened 73 years ago, I, but I've gone over this in my mind, how God took care of me. I can still remember almost word for word the things that were said. And he said, uh, it'll be about a 15-minute interview. Well, I went to work Monday, $65 a week for doing nothing but reading the Honolulu Star Bulletin from cover to cover every morning. I don't think, I'd get up and go where this old boy was working. I knew what he was doing, but he never once said a word to me the whole, I was there two and a half months, and he never spoke a word to me. He just let me know that I wasn't welcome, that's all. Well, we went down to the studio and we rehearsed the interview. There were some things said that I wasn't ashamed of, it, but he had me as a well, I was a special young American kid. That's. A, that's what he was making me. I wasn't a hero, but I was something special in his mind. We rehearsed it and got it all down, and he said, I'm going to make a record. I've got a recording over here, and we're going to make a record of, of this interview. And he said, you can have all these papers to, to remember the whole thing by. But he said, we before we can broadcast, we better let the... Navy censor it to make sure we're not giving away any information. The war wasn't over yet. Well, he took it down to the Navy, and when it come back, it could have just as well been shredded because <laughs> they blacked out this. <laughs> no names, dates, or places. All it was was a story about a young American boy that got aboard a Navy ship and went for a joyride. <laughs> And I told the captain, I said, you probably don't want to interview this. Oh, he says, I'll make something out of it. We'll go through. Well, it didn't, instead of 15 minutes, it lasted about seven or eight minutes. And I don't know what he did. So, he, he knew how to, how to make stories out of nothing. But he didn't make, he didn't make the Navy mad. He, we, got a, we got a censorship on that. 
and they gave me the record and the papers, which I gave to my daughter the, about a year or two ago, and she's lost them. <laughs> well, I don't think I could have imagined anything being as good as it had turned out there. And the captain really liked me. When I told him I was thinking about going back to the States, he said, can't you stay a, a, a while longer? I said, Captain, I've got a girlfriend back there. She was my girlfriend. I don't know what she is. I haven't heard from her for about a year. And I said, I've got a destination in mind, and I've got to go. Well, he went out the next day to the Hawaiian pineapple factory, and he came back the next day, or that night, and told me, he said, if I can talk you into staying, I got you a better job that pays $100 a week. I said, Captain, it's hard to turn down. And I showed him her picture. I said, this is my destination. I've got to go, 1317 College Avenue, Davenport, Iowa. I went down to the Navy. I said, I'm the young man that was told I could come down here when I got ready to go back to the States and you'd give me a ride back. You're who? <laughs> Never heard of you. you. We're not taking you back to the States. That's just what I thought. <laughs> so I went over and bought a ticket on the old Philippa. I, I've seen old ships. This ship, the Philippa, was commissioned in 1912. <laughs> <laughs> Top speed, eight knots. <laughs> it took eight days to get from Pearl Harbor to San Francisco. We hit a little storm, had some rough weather. I met a nice family on the way over. And they had a young girl about my age. I, said, I looked at her a time or two. We got to talking. And, at night, we'd sit out on the deck, and they'd play music. And there were three women, Royal Hawaiian women. They were going back to help make a movie in San Francisco. They were going to have a dance, have them dance. And they came out one night and did a little performance for us. And I got wound up. They were singing this, playing this old song, uh, I can't even think of the name of it now. Anyway, I started singing it, and I ended up singing the whole song, and there was clapping. Up. I, this young lady asked me, she says, can we uh, write to each other when we get off the ship? I'd like to get to know you better. I said, lady, I don't even have an address. I have no idea where I'm going to be when I get to Davenport. So I said, I'm sorry, we can't communicate by mail. And we got to San Francisco. <clears throat> I had a taxi take me to the bus depot. Bought my ticket one way at Davenport, Iowa. Went over to the barber shop. I didn't want to go home shaggy. I wanted to look the best for Marge. I don't. I had eaten a meal on on the. On the uh, on the ship and I wasn't really hungry so I didn't buy anything to eat. I just sat there and waited until seven o'clock our bus pulled in and everybody didn't get off because they were heading out a little, in a little bit later. When I got on the bus, of course I'd give them my old sea bag, they put it in the baggage compartment. There was only one seat available next to a pretty young lady. Well, I still had Marge on my mind, but I had to look at her, but I didn't speak. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't start a conversation. I didn't want her to think I was flirting. And I didn't. So I just was quiet. And she didn't say anything to me. Good along just fine. But through the night, asleep, somehow or other, we got next to each other. We woke up the morning when the bus stopped for a coffee break, and we had our heads together. I said, you want to go in and have a cup of coffee with me? And she said, no, 
I'm going to get off here. She said, why don't you get off and we can find a hotel room and have a lot of fun. Oh. <laughs> it's getting worse. <laughs> I looked at her. What do you say to a pretty young girl like that? You've been gone for a year. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. I've got a destination to keep. I can't, I can't get off. I went in and had a cup of coffee and a donut, and she was gone when I came out. I never saw her again. Thank God. He brought me home. He brought me next. The next stop we had was the Quad Cities, and I went down to the Davenport bus depot and stowed my savvy, my, my old sad, yeah, my bag. And I called my sister. I said, is, did you know where Marge is? She, my sister lives in Bettendorf. No, she could be either with her sister or maybe she's up at home. Well, I got on a, a bus and I stowed my, my bag and I, the bus took me down within a block of where I used to live, where her sister lived and I walked up with great expectations of seeing her, finding her there. She wasn't there. She had to be home. She lived up on the hill about four or five blocks. And I got out and I started uphill. When I got to 12th in college, there I met her. She, was, she had left home and a block away from her house, we met almost face to face. There was a lot of things I wanted to ask her, but I saw it all on her face. When she, she smiled a smile, I haven't never seen her since <laughs> smile like that. And her eyes sparkled and twinkled. I, she was so alive, I can't describe her face, but it answered everything I wanted to ask her. And I don't know what was said conversation-wise, but we didn't stay long. She said, I'll be down to my sister's tonight. And I said, I'll be there too. <laughs> <laughs> and when I talked to my sister, I found out that my mom had come up from Texas. My dad was building a new house in Texas. And she said she couldn't help him. So she came up to Davenport. She got word that I was two or three weeks before that I was on my way, way home. She rented an entire house furnished. There wasn't anybody living upstairs, but the downstairs was all furnished. My mom had a place for me to call home when I got home. God is still writing this story. Can you believe it? I met my girlfriend face to face. My mom's got a place for me to live. Well, I saw my sweetheart that night. And the next few days and nights I spent with my mom. Because the last time she had seen me, I was getting on a train to head to Oakland to board the Indianapolis. <clears throat> and she got there late. I was, the train had pulled away and I looked back and there I saw my mom as she followed the train down the tracks, broken hearted, she had missed me. <clears throat> so I spent two or three days with just her. And it was almost my 19th birthday. She did something she had never done for any of the other kids all, all the time we was home. She bought a birthday cake and bought a sterling silver ID bracelet for me. Well, needless to say, I had met my destination. It wasn't at 1317 College Avenue, but it was a block away. And everything I wanted had been accomplished. October 26th, that just went 2018, was 72 years that that Gorman and I had been made one. I'd come a long ways from Palaiu. I'd had a lot of experiences. But being with her and my mom, I give all the credit to God. 
He's been that way all through my life. I could write books after books. Sometime I'll tell you a story about, now hear me, the spirit of Jesus Christ called me out on the patio of where I lived and talked to me and showed me things that were to come And that's when I started my teaching vocation. He let me know that there was something I had to do. I'll tell you the story about that sometime. When Paul wrote, I knew a man one time, whether in the body or out, I don't know. God knows. And he said, I was up to paradise. One place he called it paradise, the other place he called it the third heaven. But he was taken up in the spirit, but he, could, he didn't know if he was in the spirit or in the flesh. Now you know the rest of the story, chapter 3. I made it as short as I could. There was a lot of things I left out. That it's 7.30. It's quitting time. <laughs> Has anybody got any comments or questions you want to ask? Speak loud because it's hard to hear. Okay. You got to sing this little song. It's just the chorus. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the things he has done. I didn't hear any of you singing. Stand up. <laughs> to God be the glory. To God.